You were born with individual strengths and a unique purpose. Don't let fears, false beliefs, or life's happenings diminish your influence. It's time to live and lead for impact. Host Kirsten Ross, expert of transformation, will help you defeat the drama and overcome the trauma that can stop you in your tracks. You'll gain focus, find confidence, and take bold action. Unleash passionate, purposeful you. Let's go. Welcome to Live and Lead for Impact. I'm Kirsten Ross Vogel, your host, and this is episode 275. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today because I have Jeremy Ryan Slate with me, and he's an entrepreneur, media expert, author, and CEO and founder of Command Your Brand. And I think that's an awesome topic that is of great value to anyone. So he studied literature at Oxford University and is a former champion power lifter that helps visionary founders to impact the world and better mankind through podcasting and new media to create trust and opinion leader status. Podcast Magazine just included Jeremy in their 2022 40 under 40 in podcasting list. So welcome, Jeremy. I'm really looking forward to this. Hey, Kirsten, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm stoked to be here hanging out today. Yeah. Again, like I said, commanding your brand and all the work that you're doing should be relevant to anyone who's listening. So tell me a little bit more specifically about what you do, how you do it. Uh, what's What do you help people with and how do you uh, make your impact in the world? So I really see us and, and a lot of things I do in my life as, as essentially a storyteller, right? Like I've gotten to, you know, starting my podcast back in 2015, I've, I've been lucky enough to, you know, tell hundreds and almost a thousand of incredible stories. And that's really what we do at Command Your Brand. We help people to tell their stories on the right platforms with the right hosts. We really see ourselves as the PR firm for the podcast space. And we're, we're trying to do our best job to, you know, help people find the right places to tell their stories and also help podcasters find, you know, the right guests for them as well. Because as a podcaster, you know, I care a lot about my content and what I'm creating and we're trying to, you know, really, you know, respect that too. And we're replacing guests. Awesome. So tell me what experience is it that you had that motivated you the most to make this unique impact? I don't know how to describe it other than I always resisted it. If this makes sense, like I, <laughs> I, I, by training, I have a master's in ancient history. I taught school for a couple of years and I started a podcast really because I failed at every entrepreneurial venture I tried. Just didn't really go so well. So I was working at a friend's marketing firm, building websites, and I had started the Create Your Own Life show literally just as a hobby. We saw 10,000 listens in our first month and people started asking for help. And initially I was resisting saying, you know, I can't do that. This is my art form. You know, I don't want to make money off this. And I kind of had this understanding eventually, like if you want to keep this going, you have to figure out, you know, how to fund it really. So for me, it was starting our first version of what we did, where we did a uh, podcast in a box, we were calling it. It was uh, Slate Media Productions. And one of the things we did for our clients was actually get them on other podcasts first. And we found that so many of our clients were busy and didn't really want to do all those things. So we really just focused on getting our clients on great shows and, and teaching them how to tell a better story. Initially, I really resisted it because I, I didn't want to make like money off of my art form. And you know, now it's everything I do with my daily life. Okay. So Jeremy, you should have found me earlier. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like you work through that now, but that is one of the things that I found. Back in know, the day, it was people, hard. Yeah. Well, I was going to say so many people struggle with, you know, and in my coaching, I, I work with, you know, leaders and people working to make their impact, whether it's through nonprofit or business or whatever. But, um, but too often, you know, especially business owners, they, they struggle with that asking for money thing. And I'm yes. constantly telling them, look, you're doing important work and you also need a roof over your head and food on the table. And if you don't get paid, if you don't get better, good, confident at asking for money for what you're doing, the world will be robbed of this unique, you know, impact that you're working to make your strengths and the world needs you. And so part of that is asking for the money and it's okay. <laughs> but so many people have so much on that. And it's weird because I think a lot of us have weird relationships with money. Like I know for me, um, you know, I came from a, a family where, where, you know, my, my parents have always worked really hard, but they were just both high school graduates and never really made above $50,000. So like every dollar was a big deal. And frankly, I don't know if you've seen this with people you've worked with, but early in my career, that was a real struggle for me. Like realizing like I thought $100,000 was a lot of money and like, you know, like looking at all these different income levels, like for a lot of us, 
attention on money, like really stops us out of the gate. hundred percent. Yeah. And if you have that self-limiting kind of almost fear, it turns into for people of like, if I go beyond that, like, what do I do? It starts to feel like a big responsibility, or maybe they're not, they don't feel worthy, all those kinds of things. And that's almost, yeah, that next level. So the first level is getting confident and looking someone square in the eye and knowing the value that you bring. Uh, The other thing is, you know, uh, especially in coaching, you know, anything that's not fully tangible, I'm not handing over a widget for the money, but a lot of people struggle with hearing someone come back with, oh, I don't have the money for that. And then one, they can end up devaluing themselves because of the prioritization that someone else is having with around their money. And it's really not about you. And they likely have the money. What they're just telling you is like for right now, that's not where I want to put my money. There's so many, I mean, I don't want to take us down a whole nother tangent, but there's (laughs) But there's so much when you started talking about that, I'm like, oh my gosh, no, we have to address this quickly. So yes, it's okay to get paid for what you do. And if you love what you do, because you followed your passions and you're doing what you were put on the earth to do, you're one of the luckiest people in the world. If you also get to make money doing that. So don't stand in the way of that yourself by having that fear. Well, you know, what's interesting though, too, it's, I, you, you mentioned following your passion. I actually think that's something pe- a lot of people struggle with as well. And I know I did, frankly, as well. I, I'd read a book a number of years ago called uh, So Good They Can't Ignore You by Cal Newport. And he find, he talks about finding something you're good at and continuing to pursue that until it becomes effortless and then you become passionate. I think too many people want to find passion but find they, before they find something to do. And a lot of times that can keep you from being a productive member of society and actually finding that passion. Oh, yeah. I don't think you want to table yourself while you figure things out. Well, and <laughs> I also think some people, well, I think perfectionists can like hop in the middle of that too. And people think like, I have to perfectly execute. So let me just sit here and like try to figure it all out. And what if everything and um, yeah, just get rolling and then figure out the passion piece along the way, but don't like set yourself on the sidelines of life in the meantime. But I am a a huge proponent of, you know, thinking about our passion because some people forget about that. And I think passion is the litmus test that tells us we're heading in the right direction, like gives us those clues, like the things that come so simply to us are ultimately usually linked to our, our passion and our purpose. Yeah. And I think it's those things that keep us going through the times when things aren't working out, right? Because it's not always going to be rosy and be perfect. And you have to have kind of that vision ahead of you. hundred percent. Well, that's what I always say, especially if you're a new entrepreneur or someone, you know, launching a nonprofit or whatever way you're going to use to make your impact, you better love the core because there's a whole lot of extraneous activities that you need to engage with initially, um, you know, while you're working up to being able to hire people and bring other people on to do those things. But um, yeah, you better really love the core so that you have the tenacity to go through all the bumps and and all of that. Absolutely. So you talked about kind of the, I don't think you said fear, but like the, the failures and the fears and the, um, of not being not well, kind of the fear of not wanting to ask for money for what you were doing, but how did you end up starting uh, this business? Like what specifically was it? I guess the easy way of explaining this is, you know, having a good support system, frankly. And and that comes down to my my wife has always been my business partner. And I give her all the credit in the world because she's smarter than me. She's more talented than me, but I will outwork anybody. And that combination of of the two of us has worked really, really well. And I think that's what's handled a lot of that for me is because she's looked at it from the perspective of, well, you want to keep doing this right. And you want to be able to continue doing this right. And there's a lot of people that need our help, correct? And I think when you have somebody that, aligns with you and kind of fills in those gaps where where you don't do well, it's a really, really valuable thing. And I think the thing I've found is eventually you grow past that. But for me, it was having the right person there for myself in the beginning. Yeah, that's great. So important to have at a minimum, it just has some trusted advisors around you that, you know, want you to succeed and can like speak into your life. You want to be careful of who you choose as a trusted advisor, because sometimes they have ulterior motives, et cetera. Yes. <laughs> but so yeah, this is cautionary tale, not just anyone who has advice uh, gets to be on the trusted advisor list, but it sounds like you have a great trusted advisor and your wife. And that's awesome. You are very lucky. Well, and I think that the thing that's been important for us too, and because I know everybody's life and business experience is different, but for me, like being in business with your spouse has been really important because it keeps us on the same page. I know for other people that, you know, personality wise, it doesn't work out for them or whatever, but for us, it keeps us on the same page and it keeps us doing a lot of the same things. Like when I do speaking, you know, we go to, we go together and we bring our daughters and everything else. And I think that, 
that for us, that's been pretty important. Yes. You're really lucky. So, you know, it's funny, my husband and I are both entrepreneurs, so we have separate businesses, but we're constantly collaborating and yes, and utilizing our complementary skills. And it is difficult. I'm, I feel very grateful and blessed um, as I'm sure you do, because yeah, it's a different lifestyle. And if someone that you're married to is trying to like, or, or is a significant other to you doesn't understand that that lifestyle, it can be a little more challenging. So it's great to be in it together. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. So tell me when you think back to all the people that you've helped, tell me one, you know, you're the storyteller. So tell me a story of a before and an after an impact that you really made that fuels your own passion, uh, where the transformation was so great for a client. For me, um, we have a, like, I have a big space in my heart for veterans and people that have served our country and things like that because they do a lot of things. So a lot of us, a lot of the rest of us can have freedom and not have to do those things. And one of our clients that we we got a chance to serve is a former Marine Corps sergeant. And one of the things our military struggles with a lot is suicide. And the thing that was pretty incredible about what he does is he's created a whole system of helping veterans after the military prevent suicide. And they have a really, really good rate of doing it. And he came to us when, you know, the app he had produced was brand new. He hadn't done a ton of media. And actually, we managed to get him in contact with some of his really biggest people he admired, as well as getting him in touch with all the right people in the veteran community, where now, you know, he's gotten into um, the Harvard Entrepreneurship Center. He's, you know, getting all these speaking engagements. He just spoke all across Europe. And all these things came from our program. And to me, to think that, you know, I can flow power to people that are keeping us safe and at the same time help him do well in his business. He said we were the best decision he ever made. And to me, that's that's something that really matters. Oh, that's awesome. And I love that it's attached to something that your heart soars for. So uh, thank you for that. That's a great story. So tell me, as you started your business, what was the biggest internal or external challenge that you had to overcome? And how did you overcome it? This is tough because the money thing was definitely a piece, but the other part of it as well. And, and this is something I've learned a lot and I've, I've actually you know written about extensively. For me, I, I really care a lot about what other people think. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen this a lot. A lot of people struggle with that. Mm -hmm. And early on in my business career, that really, really held me down. I remember at the time, you know, my, my first business that I jumped into before podcasting was network marketing. And, you know, I don't do that anymore, but it was kind of the first thing that I started doing. And at the time, my cousin, who was my best friend, I just wanted him to look at what I was doing and, and he wouldn't do it. And me being new at what I was doing, I was rude and I cut him off and created a whole situation. And we didn't talk for years after that. And the biggest thing I had to realize is number one, not everybody's going to support you. Number two, just because they don't doesn't mean you need to make them wrong, right? I created a big situation because of that. And I actually came back years later and apologized and said, hey, I'm sorry, I was a jerk. That wasn't cool. And I think that's one of the biggest things you have to realize is not everybody's going to be interested in what you're doing or supportive of what you're doing, but you have to be willing to continue on your mission and not invalidate them either because you're creating unnecessary antagonism for yourself. That is really key. Yeah, so many people struggle with that. And yeah, it's that, especially when you're new, right? You, you're looking for clues to validate yourself yeah. and your success. And so what that does is when we're trying to validate ourselves through other people in any way, shape or form, it puts a lot of pressure on their response. And of course, our nonverbals around that when we're having that conversation, now there's this extra pressure on them, they feel. And then ultimately, yeah, we can end up kind of monkeying around with our relationships inadvertently. I'm so glad that you figured that out and went back and cleaned it up because I'm sure that was difficult for both of you you because, um, you know, being related and, you know, the other thing is even when it's not a, a relationship, maybe it's, you know, potential client, that's not about you either. You yes. know, <laughs> I talked a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, like the asking for money piece and we don't get to keep doing that. And that if somebody says like, oh, I don't have the money for that, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have money. It's the way they're prioritizing, you know, and if you've done network marketing, you heard this, like a no is not a no. It's an, it's just a not now. So it, it isn't and that is the biggest about thing I've, that's yeah, the biggest ahead. thing I've found to continue to be true, by the way, that it's always a, a no is always a, a no right now, but not in the future. Like I've, I've told my salespeople that I've told my booking team that that is the single biggest lesson I have learned from the network marketing world is that a no then does not mean a no now. Yeah. And I love the illustration I'll share. I'm sure you heard this one too. Just, you know, like if you offer someone a stick of gum and they say, oh, no, thank you. You don't take it all personally. You're not like, oh my God, they hate gum. They <laughs> will never chew a stick of gum. Like we just take it as yeah, no, thank you. I just don't want some gum right now. <laughs> and like, we need to have that same level of attachment to someone's response and anything that we're selling. Uh, and, you know, our follow-ups, 
Um, and I know, you know, as someone who has people like your team reaching out to me to book clients, I know that there are times that I'm just too busy and I'm like, or I've gotten inundated with too many in the last couple of days. And so I just haven't gotten back. And I'm sure you guys probably even have the specific stats on it on this from your end, but like, yeah, sometimes it takes a few times reaching out and then, you know, and then the next they'll send up another one and say, Hey, I'm just getting this to the, the top of your inbox. And I always appreciate that actually. Um, and I think we all have to think in terms of that, that those reach outs, a lot of times someone will actually be appreciative. They're not sitting there thinking, Oh my gosh, this person is such a pain. They're thinking like, Oh good. Yes. Keep that top of mind. I just didn't have the time to address that right this second. I think that's a really, really important point as well. Um, because I, I, I think so many of us, number one, take it personally, which is a really big problem. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we actually see a lot of responses to our second emails or second form of reach out, whether it's an email or a LinkedIn message or a Twitter direct message or whatever it may be. It's usually very low to the first one because people are busy and they're getting so many. And literally just by following up that first time, you stand out because most people give up after the first time. Yep. And if we can remove any of that, it's about me scenario. Again, healthier relationships overall and a much more tenacity yourself. You know, we're ultimately just telling ourselves a story that we don't know what the facts are when we tell ourselves that someone's annoyed with us, they're never going to respond, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or I'm not good or whatever it is. So if you're going to make up a story, just make one up that serves you. And, uh, you know, if you didn't hear back, just keep telling yourself, wow, they're super busy and they're going to be so appreciative that I kept reaching out again. It's interesting too, because I don't know what you've seen around this, Kirsten. Like for me, the, the, the way I solved that for myself was, was actually, you know, as I mentioned, I did a bunch of entrepreneurial things before I did the podcast that didn't really work out. One of those was selling life insurance. And mm. I learned how to make 50 to 100 phone calls a day. And by the time you get to that many, they don't really hurt anymore. And I've frankly found that cold calling or just kind of reaching out to a lot of people, you stop caring as much about you know how they're responding to you and more about how you're handling the situation. But we tend to put a lot of attention on it when we're doing very little or something or in small amounts. Yes. Well, and, and um, yeah, you can become numb to it and you get more experience. And yeah, and you start to realize it, it isn't about me and I'm just, it's a volume thing. It's a numbers thing. I thankfully have not done <laughs> cold calling, um, but, uh, but I have been in other circumstances where sure. And I play it like a game. Like if there yeah. are things that I'm just like, just play it like a game, see what you can make happen. And um, if you keep that attitude again, you're telling yourself the story. So don't, don't tell a story that doesn't serve you. Tell one that uh, gives you the tenacity to keep going, but good for you, man. That's, that is. <laughs> stuff cold calling to sell life insurance. <laughs> well, and even too, one of my early businesses, uh, like I, I tried all these businesses to like try and make my, my network marketing business work when I realized that I just wasn't right for the opportunity because there's all different ones out there. And for me, one of the things I did is I started an in-home personal training company where I was like knocking on people's doors and doing surveys to get clients. So it's like, I've tried everything. So I'm kind of willing to do anything at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That is some good tenacity right there. Um, and I was a personal trainer back in the day too. There you <laughs> go. Not, even that I did not go, I did not go door to door with a survey. So, um, so that's great. Tell me, how do you stay motivated and moving during any tough times that you, that you're up against? You know, I, I think it goes back to the one thing we've been talking about and that is purpose. I think so many times it's the purpose of why we're doing what we're doing that keeps us going through the hard times. So for us, we're trying to give voice to people that really need a voice. And when you take a look at that and you say, you know what, it's been a hard day today, but there's people that need my help. I think that's one of the biggest things you have to take a look at. And for me, it's always been about purpose. And I think when you can take a look at what you're doing and you can find the purpose in what you're doing, it works. When you look at anything you've ever failed at or it hasn't worked well at, you're probably going to have a hard time finding out the purpose in it. So I think when you can keep that ahead as kind of like your North Star and you always have something to come back to, that, that's to me, whether that's what always guided us. That's great. And I do think focusing on that absolutely will help you have the tenacity. You know, one of the questions that I asked during this podcast is something that even when I'm meeting with teams, Teams, I have people do, which is, you know, think back to one time where, where you really made a big impact. And I can tell you uh, just transformations that have happened with teams where, you know, sometimes we just get a little far away from why do we do what we do? Because, you know, we just get busy and emergencies are happening and, you know, and challenges are rising and you can end up so focused on all of that because that, that comes at us. And so that that requires our attention. And, um, and then we can forget what is the passion that brought me 
and the purpose that brought me to what I'm doing. And it is a great practice for everyone to keep one or two of those top of mind, type them out, write them out, keep them near you so that you have that. Again, when you have those particularly tough times, you can think back to like, oh man, I will never forget the day. I mean, I've been coaching for like about 20 years and I still remember one of the first people that I coached before I, like this was like while I was still training and um, all those years ago. And I remember the transformation that she went through and it was so exciting because it was like, oh, Oh my gosh, like I've been accidentally <laughs> doing this my whole life. And now I am putting into practice and like, oh my gosh, it's working. And I still remember that excitement and you need that. You need to be grounded. You need that positive energy at times to keep you moving. I think that's really, really important too, because one of the things that, that we do as well um, is number one, we start every meeting with, you know, the mission statement of why we're doing what we're doing. And I think that's important. But also at the same time is you're going to have days you have losses. You're going to have days you get beat up. You're going to have days things don't go well. So what we actually do is, um, I know I do this and we have team members do this, is actually watch some of the video success stories we get from clients as well. Because when you hear out of someone else's mouth what you've done for them, that really brightens you up and kind of pulls you out of it. So those are two things that we've really focused on. That's awesome. You know, I'll add too, if you're not already doing this, the power in having each person do their own personal mission, I call it a mission center job statement, which is different from a job description, which is the legal thing that you need. But have each person, like once you have the mission of the, of your, you know, organization, your company, have them do a mission center job statement, just a sentence or two of what is it that they do to help fulfill that mission? Because sometimes you can get a, be a little bit, dis especially as organizations gets larger, you know, someone might not ever be front facing towards what the business actually is. So for instance, I think in terms of someone who, you know, like accounts payable or accounts receivable, you know, they're, they may never talk to, you know, like if it's in a clinic, they may never talk to a patient themselves. However, their job statement is going to talk about the fact that if the money doesn't keep coming in to keep the place open again, back to like, we need money coming in to keep doing our work. Um, so there are still at, you know, or like the person at the front desk, they're not just answering the phone. They're in uh, talking to patients as they're coming in, they're creating a beautiful, warm, welcoming environment for people to be healed. So uh, I think it's so important for people to have in their own words and attach because then that mission really, really becomes real for everyone. And even the smallest task elevates and becomes most Im more important. I love that. And I may have to steal that because that is not something we do. And that, that's <laughs> oh, just, do that. it's just great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had I've for years I've been having yeah, I would absolutely do that. It's it's a fun exercise also to to, you know, let people think creatively about their work. Like when I'm speaking and I share on this, I use the example of like a gardener at a church or we could say a synagogue or whatever, but they're not just digging in the dirt and planting flowers. Again, they're creating a beautiful welcoming environment for people to come and experience God. Like, woo, that just like, isn't that way better than digging in the dirt and planting flowers and cutting grass? <laughs> well, because you're, you're really getting yourself in the mindset of how you're part of the bigger picture. Yes. Um, and, and I think that's uh, like, for us, that is one thing that we do. We don't do it in that way, but one thing we really do is everybody knows like in their division of the company, what is the valuable final product that their job produces and how does it go on to the next part of the company? So it's not quite a mission statement like yeah. for that position, but they do understand where they fit in the bigger picture. And I think when your team doesn't understand where they, they fit in the bigger picture, you're going to have problems with people that, you know, aren't as engaged on a daily basis. So I think that's just important as well. Yes. Yeah. I always say like, you don't want people moving piles of dirt because that's a form of war torture was moving piles of dirt from one side of a field to another. Every day they would get up and move that pile of dirt. If they were moving that pile of dirt to build an orphanage or a hospital, they would be energized at the end of the day. But so same physical force to move the pile of dirt, but without a sense of purpose. Now it is torture literally because we humans need that sense of purpose. And so if we're forgetting to attach tasks to that purpose, we can have people moving piles of dirt. The whole inspiration, by the way, for this whole thing was from a housekeeper that worked at a hospital that I worked at many, I was in human resources. This is like, gosh, 25, I don't know. Wait, I'm old. So long, long, long time ago. But anyway, she was always in a really good mood. And I just had to ask her because you can imagine how difficult it would be to be a housekeeper at a large hospital. And I just said, you know, how do you keep your mood up? You're always in a good mood. You're always positive. You're always energetic. And she just said, like, whenever I you know, run across a particularly bad mess. I think about how sick that person is feeling. And I know that I'm playing a part in helping them feel better. And so that has been my mission since to just think about like everyone needs that same mindset, regardless of the work that they're doing. I love that viewpoint because that's so important to be able to, to take a look at that. And I don't know, it's almost like 
flipping it and taking joy in your work. And I think when you can, mm -hmm. you can do that and, and really operate from a place of gratitude, I think it's, it's, it's different in how you're going to come through the day. Absolutely. And that's where you get your engaged team because now everyone and the sense of value that they feel in it, the importance. And again, now you're elevating, even emptying a garbage can. It's not just like another garbage can. It's like this, there is a purpose to this. There's a meaning and it is a huge, you know, makes a big impact because it's one tiny piece of this huge thing that we're making happen together. Yeah. So tell me what words of wisdom would you share for others who want to make their own impact? Maybe they're just getting started. What would you tell them? You know, I, when I, when I take a look at that, that the thing I would say is I would say like, you know, what is your basic purpose? Because I think too many times, you know, we don't really explore that. And the thing I would say to that is don't be afraid to do a lot of things before you find it. I think there's a lot of people that decide they have to find their purpose or find their whatever that is without doing anything. And they need that in order to do anything. For me, I did a lot of things I didn't like to find what I liked. And I think that's what you have to be willing to do is go out and find your purpose, but do a lot of work to get there and realize that the first thing, the second thing, the third thing may not be the thing. If you hit it right the first time, that's amazing. And you're very lucky for that. But I would say, you know, go out and find your purpose but willing to work towards that purpose. Yes. I So often I find myself like, if you don't take action, there's too many unanswered questions that you'll never answer until you take action. So I, I kind of get back to that. Like, don't wait until you can perfectly execute whatever it is or know that, oh, for, for sure, this is my purpose. I'm at that target, that bullseye. It will take time. And the only way that you can get closer and closer is by getting into action and answering those unanswered questions. You know, it's, it's funny because I find so many times when you talk to people that say they don't like what they're doing, you find they're usually doing nothing or they're kind of doing something that doesn't really serve a purpose. And you have to realize you have to get in action to find it. And I think that's a lot of what, you know, we've been talking about here. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy, for talking to me today. So tell me uh, the kinds of people that you would love to connect with and then give them your link. Now I will say all the links, all the information notes from this conversation will all be at the show notes for today, which you'll be able to find by going to defeat the drama.com, click on the podcast tab and go to episode 275. But Jeremy, where can they find you and who do you want to have reach out to you? So we're looking to connect with CEOs and founders to help tell their stories and they can find us over at commandyourbrand.com. Also, I have a brand new book coming out in June called Unremarkable to Extraordinary. And it really talks about a lot of what we talked about today, actually, that, you know, the strategies on how to create the life you want to create, how to find your purpose, how to get things done. And if they head over to getextraordinarybook.com, they can pre-order that for the June 21st release. And when they do, they'll actually be able to get a free version of the audiobook and our guide of 30 days to extraordinary that's over at get extraordinary book.com. Awesome. So get extraordinary book.com definitely head over there. Thank you, Jeremy. And I will say if you already have a team or you're just working to make your impact, do check out my impact academy.com. Uh, that's where you can find all kinds of video, audio, PDF download, and every other week time with me to go and many uh, other people who are working to make their impact. It's a great networking opportunity as well, but we talk all things strategy every other week. Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but head over to myimpactacademy.com forward slash join to get more information about that. You can try it out for free for 14 days. So I definitely recommend doing that. Maybe join right on a Wednesday. So you for sure, maybe you'll even get two Wednesdays in for that first 14 days, but it's something that you're not going to want to drop. There's tons of information that I've created over more than 20 years. So uh, I hope to connect with you there as well. And again, Jeremy, thanks so much for joining me and do connect with Jeremy and uh, he has so much to offer and uh, thank you, Jeremy, and make it a great rest of your day. Hey, thank you so much for having me. 